Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Issues with GDA TVC's online interactive program on this yet another rainy Saturday. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. The week opened on a sad note when on Sunday, Governor Nasio El Rufai of Kaduna State announced the death of his former deputy, Barnabas Yusuf Balabantex. Still on Sunday, Lagos State Government directed all religious houses in the state to operate at 50% capacity due to COVID-19 concerns, specifically the third wave. But there were worries just as unsettling as the third wave of COVID-19 occurring in many parts of the country. Yes, insecurity. First in Anambra State, gunmen killed three policemen and two others in Idemili North local government area. Also, a first-class traditional ruler in Kogi State, the Adogu of Egai Alaji Mohammed Adembe, was on Tuesday evening kidnapped by unidentified abductors. As if that was not enough, a director at the Nigerian Army Headquarters in Abuja, Major General Hamid, was also killed by unknown assailants who abducted his wife. Perhaps worried by the rising insecurity, the House of Reps has asked the federal government to hire foreign mercenaries to fight insurgents. That's our first topic. Our second talking point is this. National Assembly passes Electoral Act as opposition lawmakers stage walkout. Welcome again to Issues with GD. We're well, very glad that you could join us on yet another rainy, cold, but beautiful weekend. This is Issues with GD, TBC's online interactive program. And BKO is joining us via Zoom. Let's welcome him. Hello, BKO. It's good to be with you again. Yes, a very good evening to you. The issue of foreign mercenaries has been a huge talking points, particularly on our sister program, Journalist Hangout. We've had a security expert talk to us extensively about it. And of course, I know, BKO, your position is not hidden. Just give us a recap about the benefits of using foreign mercenaries to fight insurgents, which you had you know, stated passionately in the past. I... I am a supporter, a big, big supporter of the idea of um, using private military contractors. Some people like to call them mercenaries, but um, I would rather call them private military contractors. Because in 2015, just before the election, the government of Bulo Jonathan hired them, um, specifically a company called Specialized Tax Training Equipment and Protection, STEP, STP. to help us prosecute the war. They have tremendous know-how. They have been involved in wars in Liberia, and other places, they have the equipment that um, our troops do not have. They have radar uh, by which they can monitor an area, determine the precise location of the enemy, and then um, uh, take decisive action. They are also good at imparting knowledge, training, our troops, training our airmen. So it's not uh, fighters on ground, uh, uh, tacticians, yeah. tacticians who, who can offer okay. valuable okay. advice. Um, on the way the war should be prosecuted. And then as um, trainers of 
our airmen, our air, uh, air force men, and also as uh, tacticians about the air campaign. So these people, in my view, are very, very useful. In fact, the US Army, which in my view is the strongest army in the world, has been using um, private military contractors for so long. In fact, a lot of the fatalities recorded on the US side during the um, war in Afghanistan, as well as the war in Iraq, were um, the private military contractors. They were, they were hired to provide protection even for troops, protected uh, troops and high caliber officials of the government in Iraq at that time. So, given the, the frenetic pace with which we recover territories that Boko Haram controlled just before the election in 2015, uh, there is no way we can dismiss the contributions of the private military contractors. And that's why you see someone like the governor of Borno State, who is in the thick of the action, who, who is in Borno State where this war is being waged, has consistently asked for these private military contractors. In February, when there was an attack on civilians in Borno State, the governor came out to say, look, at this time we need these private military contractors. The House of Reps in March this year also made that demand. The reason this is coming, uh, becoming um, uh, an issue at this time is because the House of Reps organized a security summit and it, the decision to advise the government of President Buhari to hire these private military contractors was the highlight of the numerous uh, decisions uh, and the resolutions that were reached by, by the, the, the House of Reps at that uh, security uh, summit. Of course, they, they made other demands like um, the need to purge the armed forces of um, double agents and moles who are compromising the laudable efforts of uh, their colleagues in the armed forces. And of course, the, the, the need for us to review our strategy and probably come up with fresh strategies that can uh, effectively guarantee us uh, victory against the enemy because we've been using the same strategy over time and these one-out strategies are not uh, delivering the killer blow on the enemy. So in my view, this was a good uh, suggestion coming from the, um, the, the House of Reps and this is not the first time that uh, these private military contractors will be used. Nigeria is not the first country to use them, and Nigeria won't be the last. But the, 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 the truth is they are very valuable, but our president opposed the idea of um, private military contractors that are derogatively uh, referred to as mercenaries. He sees the whole idea as shameful, and he refused to renew the contract. Uh, uh, that's where, that that's where I'm headed, BQ. How far can the House resolution go, giving President Buhari's uh, disposition towards it? Yes, it's just an advice. Uh, he's the Commander-in-Chief. He, he, he has um, the powers to either take the advice uh, or refuse to take it. But what Nigerians want to see is an end to the nonsense that bandits and the uh, Boko Haram uh, members uh, uh, are doing in our country. And the, the president has to uh, rise to the occasion and um, 
take necessary steps to put an end to the killings that are happening in our country every day. If, um, if his own methods have not yielded dividends, then there is nothing wrong in, uh, in um, borrowing ideas from other people. One thing I have to say, and I've said it before, is that the president underrated Boko Haram because I remember when he was talking, uh, just after he won the election, when he was referring to the war in the Northeast, he said, how are the mighty falling that Cameroon had to come into Nigeria to help us fight uh, the insurgents. He then said, how are the mighty falling? But I disagree that um, getting people to help us win a war is, um, uh, diminishes Nigeria. America went into the war with Iraq after mobilizing many countries of the world. In fact, a country like France that doesn't like fighting on the same side with the US and will naturally not want uh, to subordinate itself to US uh, military uh, uh, command and control, had to get involved in the, in the uh, Gulf War because the Americans worked hard to, to get everyone on board. Why didn't America decide that, oh, I can go it alone. I, I have the strongest army in the world. I have the best Air Force in the world. Therefore, let me go it alone. They didn't do that. They got countries, many countries of the world to assist them. So Nigeria has sacrificed its soldiers, its officers and men to bring peace to many countries of the world. Lebanon, Sierra uh, Leone, uh, Liberia, name it. Those frontline states. So there's nothing wrong if we um, ask for support from uh, other countries of the world to win a war that, in actual fact, we cannot win without the support of our neighbors. We have a country like Niger Republic that in my view is like a semi failed state, sharing borders with no less than six Nigerian states. Mm. From there, weapons can come into our country. From there, uh, foreign fighters can come into our country. So we need the support of a, a country like Niger, even Cameroon and Chad, for us to defeat the insurgency. So there's nothing wrong in, uh, in uh, asking for help. Now you have not asked for help or you have not been able to deal a decisive blow on the enemy. Mm. All we hear is technical defeat. There is no such thing as technical defeat. If you have not defeated the enemy, you have not defeated, not the, defeated enemy. the enemy. Yes, there is no such thing as the technical defeat. You can talk about technical knockout in boxing, but not in, uh, in, uh, uh, in a military... War terrorism. Uh, in the context of the military, can you talk about a, a, a technical defeat? That's absolutely uh, more hard of. So, BQ, what about the concern of funding? And I know that you have said over and over in, again in the past that the country had left the military, so to speak, unattended to, and and there was no recruitment, there was no investment funding of the military. So would it be too much of an opportunity cost if the federal government invested in private military contractors instead of funding the military to be more efficient in the fight against terrorism? You know, they, they have to go together. Um, for example, on the issue of training, those those private military contractors can, can help our troops to become better by training them, by introducing them to new skills and new methods that they, they have not been used to. Because for many years, we were not sending troops on foreign training the way we used to do. People like Brian Babangida and the rest of them, they attended some of the best military schools in the world. They went to Sandust and the rest of them. Such military training are a reality these days. And an untrained or an, uh, uh, an officer that is not properly trained is useless to the armed forces. 
So we need training and constant retraining. And I'm saying that these private military contractors can also play that role. They can play that role. But they don't have the numbers to uh, get them effectively deployed in all of the areas where we need uh, military intervention in our country. So we still have to use Nigerian troops. You still have to deploy Nigerian troops to all of the problem areas. But the critical, the very critical areas, and that's what, that was even the suggestion of, uh, of the House of Reps, that in areas needing critical military intervention, that we can hire these guys and, uh, and uh, get them to do the job. For example, there are places in our country that Boko Haram still occupies. You hear stories that they, they are not occupying any territory, but the people saying that know in their hearts that they are lying. There are still places that they occupy till tomorrow. Mm. Some we have tried to dislodge them and, and, and didn't succeed. With the support of uh, the private military contractors, I'm confident that we can chase Boko Haram away from some of their, their, their strongest, uh, I mean, their strongholds, so that we can keep our communities uh, free of terrorists. Mm. Hopefully. But we still have to recruit. Recruitment into the army must be sustained, and we must, uh, every year, from the look of things, we should be in recruiting no less than 5,000 to 10,000 fighters into the into the the army because for years we didn't think it was necessary we deceived ourselves that um, you do not need a large army in peacetime now we, we we have realized the need for a large army because even when you conquer um, a, a territory from Boko Haram Um, it's happening to us. The arm, our armed forces have captured some communities up to three times. Okay. The enemy okay. comes back and, and, and takes the place. They, they just wait. They know that you don't have enough troops to, to hold the ground everywhere that you, you've uh, gained victory. So they, they, they want, if the place is uh, strategic to them, they just wait for some time. They know that the troops will be moved to somewhere else. So they come back and reoccupy a place where they had been uh, effectively dislodged. So that is because we don't have uh, enough troops. And the army is overstretched across the country. The army is fighting uh, left, right, and center. Uh, there are very few states, maybe just two or three states, where you do not see significant military uh, presence. So the war in the northeast and in the north uh, central and Northwest against bandits uh, is suffering as a result of uh, insufficient mm. uh, troops on ground. Mm. Mm. So funding for private military contractors and the Nigerian military must go side by side. And of course, uh, the military can profit from training in that whole process. It's still issues with GDA. Remember, you can ask your questions so start thinking of them or start sending them if you have them already. But we'll go for our second topic before we begin taking your questions. Thank you for holding on. So BK, let's go to our next topic. I'm particularly interested in knowing if um, you were surprised by the outcome of the National Assembly's decision towards the electronic transmission of election results, particularly because, you know, last week together we were here when we talked about how governors of the South across party lines said no to electronic transmission of results. But if we look at the voting, particularly in the House of Reps, it was 60 to 28 30 to 28. Years. 30 years like to that. it. The governor said yes to electronic transmission. Can you hear me, right? Okay. Um, I would not say that I'm completely surprised. Um, naturally, you will expect that the governors 
having had their meeting with the the, the Southern Caucus of the Senate, for example, that the issue of um, um, electronic transmission of results will have been resolved in favor of the electronic transmission of uh, results. But I guess the two dominant parties had separate meetings, apart from the meeting um, with the governors, where it was decided that where the PDP, for example, made up their minds that they would support the electronic transmission of uh, results, and clearly the APC opposed the idea of electronic transmission of results against the decision reached with governors earlier on. Mm. Because when you look at the voting pattern from the Southwest, senators overwhelmingly oppose the idea of electronic transmission of results. You then ask yourself mm -hmm. that, didn't these senators, uh, didn't these senators um, agree with governors that, the governors of the south, southern states that um, electronic transmission of results was the way to go. But, you know, politics is a dynamic game and uh, it doesn't even take an hour for politicians to change their minds about an issue. It's possible that after the meeting with the governors, the, the leaders of the APC, after the uh, meeting of the senators with the governors, the leaders of the APC said, look, this could be a banana peel. And you know, they have been talking about the issue of um, uh, technology uh, being abused and uh, the fear of hacking and all that. So they felt that from their position, their current position is much more comfortable than going into uncharted territory, going into something that they are not sure of. So they told their party men and women to not support this. There was a caucus meeting that was held earlier. Yes, nobody told us that uh, that was the essence of the caucus meeting. Inclined to believe. I heard PK last on inclined. Inclined on result because the, so the overwhelming, be okay, the like overwhelming support. Yeah. Okay. I said the overwhelming support. The overwhelming support that the APC lawmakers gave the idea of manual transmission of results suggests that a decision has been reached with party leaders to uh, go along that line. And the way the uh, PDP members also voted for electronic transmission of results suggests that clearly they had uh, made up their minds along with members of the, the leaders of their party to vote in support of the electronic transmission results. So what we saw clearly was a case of people voting along party lines. Hmm. Um, I know that for some of the people who voted against the electronic transmission results, in their hearts, they believe that that is the way to go. But once it is the decision of the party to go against it, to advertise themselves as good party men and women, they just have to support the position of their party. So uh, it's no longer news that APC lawmakers oppose the idea of, um, of uh, electronic transmission of results, and they showed that on the floor of both the House of Reps and the, and the, uh, the Senate. Even when the PDP 
uh, House of Rest members worked out, they still proceeded to pass that bill, you know, in spite of the people who had worked out. So clearly they had made up their minds that this was um, what they wanted. And I, I do not even, I, I believe that whatever happened, that is a decision that they will still have taken. Uh, in, in conversations with some of the lawmakers uh, of the PDP, I told them, I said, you do not have major, uh, majority in both houses. So the party that has the majority can use the majority that it, it uh, enjoys um, to, 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 to influence things in the house and ensure that um, its interests uh, are protected. So I think that by and large, many of the, these uh, lawmakers felt that their interests would be better protected under uh, the manual uh, transmission of uh, resource regime than, um, than the idea of electronic transmission of resource that is new to them that the one sure could not um, be used, I mean, could not be abused or could not um, be used to give um, victory to, to somebody who does not deserve it. I am in support of the use of technology to deepen, uh, to, to, to reform our electoral process, to make our elections more credible. I think that the more we get technology involved, the better for us as a nation. But I am not a politician. And the way I think is not the way the average politician thinks. In fact, the average politician will hate me for my views. But this is the, this is the way it is. I believe that uh, it's unfair to jettison the idea of electronic transmission of results because I think that is the future. And if we truly want free and fair elections in our country, if we truly want to shut out thugs and people who hijack ballots on the way to collation centers, then electronic transmission of results is the way to go. But mm. the politicians can be unpredictable. Uh, the Nigerian politicians, majority of them, think of the moment and not the future. What they have denied today could actually cost them electoral victories in the future. But that's not how they think. They think of, mm. of the, the now. Mm. They think of now. Uh, I heard PK last time. Relations so, better. But as He's I now wait being for frustrated. a reconnection, I believe that's network problem. Okay, Dwiki is back. Hello? Now. You're back now. Yes. I mean, um, INEC should have been encouraged to deploy technology to make our elections more credible. But the uh, politicians who are the lawmakers see things differently. They, they, they would rather frustrate INEC's desires to make our elections more credible. I'm back. I'm back. I next. I have I have many more questions for you, but I'll give um, opportunity to our viewers now to ask their own questions. If there's time, I'll put in one or two more questions. Truthfully, is asking, does the Constitution still give INEC the independence to act? I believe he's referring to. Um, the House leaving the decision on electronic transmission of results to INEC. I don't think that is what has happened. I don't think um, the house, the house has left it to INEC. If you recall, the house, the speaker of the House of Representatives told us that the following day, that they were going to bring, they were going to bring um, uh, the NCC representatives as well as the um, INEC 
to the House to explain, uh, to, to throw more light on this electronic uh, transmission of results. But at the end of the day, INEC was not allowed to, to speak to that issue. It was only the NCC that were permitted to, to speak. Whereas INEC had had meetings upon meetings with, uh, with um, telco, the telcos in the country, the mobile uh, telephony operators, about how it can deploy technology and the conduct of violations. As far back as 2018, there was a technical committee that was set up involving the NCC, involving uh, the, um, the mobile uh, telephony service providers. And at that uh, technical committee, the telcos who are the drivers of this whole initiative, because it's not NCC that is the driver, the telcos said the processes that INEC was uh, trying to introduce would work. And they said even where there is not, um, uh, there, even in the most remote areas, that they were capable of deploying technology to ensure that we have electronic transmission of results. But INEC was not allowed to speak at the House of Reps. What we had was just the NCC guys um, telling us that uh, uh, that there is no system work. that is perfect. Yes, I believe that INEC should have been allowed to speak on the floor of the House of Red. Okay, we have Murita La. And INEC confident that he can successfully deploy uh, uh, um, uh, um, technology to make our elections better. Because this whole thing, INEC had uploaded results in the past. Even in remote areas, INEC organized by elections and, and introduced this technology. And it was successful. So I do not believe that INEC cannot get this job done. But of course, the decision um, is in the hands of the lawmakers. And they've taken the decision to not let, to set everybody back by not allowing electronic transmission of uh, results. Okay, so there's Muritala Ola Tsunji. He says, why are we not expanding the military training with large-scale recruitment instead of foreign mercenaries? Well, whether foreign mercenaries, they are the ones calling them mercenaries. Uh, in, in the modern age, they are called private military contractors. And if a country like America uses them, there is no better country than America when it comes to war warfare. There is no country that spends money on military hardware than America. America has far more war planes than Russia. None of the big countries of the world comes close to America when it comes to warplanes and even submarines. So if a, a country like America, as great as it is, can use private military contractors, whom we call mercenaries derogatorily, then there's no reason for Nigeria to not use them. We are not saying they should be deployed all across the country, but they could be deployed in very critical areas and they could help in the training of our troops. That is the point that I'm making. But we are not even recruiting enough into the army. And that is a very big problem. We are not recruiting enough. We are without sufficient uh, uh, troops to, to wage this war. It will be difficult to win. Is it time to take the next question? Is it network problem now? Okay, so Jacob Olanipekun says, Sir, what is our government doing in the area of maintenance of our military equipment? I observe that they lack maintenance culture. 
That is true. Um, and that is a Nigerian problem. I don't think it's peculiar to the military. Uh, even the police look at some of their vehicles. After a few months, you see those vehicles looking really bad. Maintenance uh, culture is what we have not imbibed sufficiently. Then, of course, even training. Because when you, when you acquire weaponry, part of the package is the spears that you need, as well as the trainers who would also train your own people to be able to, I mean, as well as the technicians, who would train your people to be able to service those uh, uh, military hardware. Now, when we acquired the T-72 Russian member to turn during the Jonathan era, we were all excited, but a lot of those armor tanks are grounded now because the contract for for training was not renewed well, i mean for for contract for servicing and maintenance was not renewed some of our officers can also um, service this equipment but we do not have enough people with the right know-how with the know-how to, to take good care of this, uh, this uh, equipment, to service them regularly. And you also know even the issue of servicing. Sometimes we don't release money for servicing a uh, good time. And within a short time, uh, the equipment goes bad. So this is the, the thing. I think the issue of maintenance the culture is something that we have to take seriously. It's not um, um, a problem with the young forces alone. I think it's a general Nigerian problem that yeah. we don't maintain. You, you, you check into an hotel this year, after a few years, you see that some of the, the facilities uh, um, are no longer in tip-top shape. This is the way we are, but we, we've got to change as a people. Absolutely. That... Uh, we can't say enough of. This is where we drop the anchor on issues with GDA. There is no time for my own additional question. But I'll leave it there. We thank our online viewers, particularly those who sent in their questions. Murita Laolatsunji, truthfully, Jacob Holani Kwekun, thank you so much for sending in your questions. We urge you to join us again same time next week. But in the meantime, before you exit your YouTube channels, Click on the subscribe buttons, which will also enable you to watch all the editions of Issues with Judy and get notifications once a new edition is uploaded. You can also follow us on all our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, at TVC News NG. Thank you again, BKO. It's great to hang out with you as usual. All right, so join us again same time next week. Bye for now.